In Article I, Section 8, Clause 1, the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the power to collect taxes. So it stands to reason that Congress has power to spend the money. But where exactly does the Constitution say this? The words spend or spending don't appear anywhere in the text of the Constitution. But in this section, the words pay and provide for do appear. The long-standing understanding of this language is that it authorizes Congress to spend money. So for that reason, many modern court opinions will refer to this as the spending clause. So what can Congress spend its money on? Well, of course, the government can use its money to pay off debts. But it can also spend money on anything else that will serve the common defense and general welfare. This means that the government is not limited to spending money only on those activities that are described in Congress's other enumerated powers, things like the power to have post offices or to support armies. For example, the Constitution has no enumerated power over medical research, but Congress could choose to spend money on medical research if Congress thinks that, that expenditure would be for the general welfare. The spending power also explains why the federal government today has a significant role in education policy. Congress does not have an enumerated power specifically dedicated to education, but modern Congresses have chosen to spend money on education because they think it's part of the general welfare. Now, especially since World War II, the spending power has become the basis for a great deal of federal government activity, from road building to poverty reduction, to support for the arts and sciences. This Kickstarter summarizes the spending clause principles most likely to arise for litigators and courts. At the outset, you will notice a major similarity between the taxing power and the spending power. Namely, both are political decisions. If Congress wants to spend money to send astronauts to the moon or to buy everyone a cupcake on their birthday, that's a legislative decision for Congress to make. However, courts have a small role when it comes to the conditions that go along with some expenditures. When the federal treasury sends money to a recipient, there are almost always strings attached, and these are known as conditions. Now, in principle, there's nothing wrong with distributing money with conditions attached. For example, if Congress appropriates money to build a dam, the contractors don't simply receive a gift that they can use however they want, as a condition of receiving the money, the contractors are expected to actually build the dam. Similarly, when Congress appropriates money to be distributed to local school districts, Congress can control how the recipient school districts use that money. As Congress's spending has come to have more and more influence, the Supreme Court has identified some ways in which federal spending might, if it's not structured properly, interfere with state autonomy. So, for reasons dealing largely with federalism, courts will sometimes examine whether conditions on federal spending are somehow improper. Part B of the Kickstarter summarizes the factors that South Dakota v. Dole identified as relevant to the propriety of federal spending. In the Dole decision itself, these factors were suggested in a somewhat off-the-cuff manner, but they are now frequently quoted and they're popularly known as the Dole factors. Now, the first of these factors is drawn from the text of the spending clause. However, even the Dole opinion itself noted that it's up to the legislature and not the courts to decide whether spending the money will actually serve the general welfare. So in practice, the only ways a federal expenditure might violate the spending clause would involve the other four factors, and a law must satisfy all of them to be constitutional. A good way to get familiar with these factors is to challenge yourself to come up with examples of statutes that would either satisfy or violate each of these factors. The requirement for conditions to be unambiguous is designed to avoid unfair surprise to the recipient. A recipient should not suddenly find itself being sued or suffering other adverse consequences that they did not know in advance were possibilities. Please pause the video at this point and invent some spending statutes that you think are and are not unfairly ambiguous.
My own example of an unconstitutionally ambiguous spending condition is one that would require the recipient to use the money wisely. That's a term that's subject to debate and could be enforced in a way that imposes unfair surprises. Next, the condition has to have a sensible relationship to the purposes of the overall spending program. Please pause the video and invent some conditions on spending that are and are not germane to the underlying spending program. My own examples involve conditions on federal education spending. The requirement that the state teach certain material in exchange for education money seems related to the overall purpose of the spending. It seems germane. However, a requirement that a state give raises to all its park rangers in exchange for education funding is not germane. There's no discernible connection to education, and this would be an unconstitutional condition on the spending. Next, Congress cannot use its spending power to pursue actions that would be unconstitutional for the federal government to do itself. For example, under the Eighth Amendment, the government cannot impose cruel and unusual punishment. This means that Congress could not give money to states to subsidize their criminal justice systems on the condition that the states impose cruel and unusual punishments. Please pause the video and invent some spending statutes that do or do not violate this principle. My example involves equal protection. The federal government cannot itself engage in sex discrimination, so it can't require recipients of federal funds to engage in sex discrimination either. Concerns about federalism have led the Supreme Court to include, as a final factor on the Dole list, an idea that the spending bargain cannot, taken as a whole, be coercive. Now, this factor helps protect states' autonomy. However, the meaning of coercion in this context remains somewhat unsettled. If I offered you a million dollars to do something, we would not ordinarily consider that to be coercion. My offer of money certainly encourages you to do something, but it does not coerce you. You aren't any worse off if you don't take the money, and you don't have to do what I ask. So to have any meaning in this context, the notion of coercion can't mean the same thing as it might mean under the duress defense that exists in criminal law and tort law. So at this point, pause the video and invent spending statutes that you think are or are not coercive. My example of non-coercive spending is a federal program to encourage state governments to train police about implicit bias. Most states would enjoy receiving an extra dollar for each thousand dollars they would otherwise spend on police training, but this subsidy amounts to only one one-hundredth of a percent of their total police training budget. A state could easily afford to turn this down if it didn't want to do the implicit bias training or if it didn't want to do the specific type of training required by the federal program. As for a spending law that is coercive, I'm purposely leaving that question open for now. You'll be reading some cases that touch on the coercion question, and I want you to have the experience of figuring out on your own what counts as coercion.